We've just a week to go now before we're live on stage with the new show, Cocaine Cowboys. Final tickets on sale for Limerick, Cork and Dublin from mcd.ie, our venues. I think Charles McLean is one of these really interesting characters in the shadows of the underworld because really before he came to court on a number of charges relating to gangland murders and attempted murders, we wouldn't have known of his existence because he's kind of out there in the background. But Charles McLean, and he's originally from St. Mark's Grove in Clondalk, and he's 35 now. This week, he pleaded guilty to a slightly complicated uh, charge in relation to the murder of the gangland figure Mark guinea pig Desmond and that was he is admitted to impeding the apprehension of the person who murdered him Um, now that's one of those your favourite gangland legislation but yeah McLean is already serving two sentences yeah he's already he's I mean it's almost unheard of that somebody has been convicted of playing a role in three uh, gangland shootings I suppose um, because ultimately uh he was convicted in relation to the murder of Thomas McCarthy, which was a very uh, unusual murder in that no motive uh, was ever really um, brought to, to light. Um, Let's go through a little bit of the details of that one. Yeah. So that was in 2020, in July of that year. And Thomas McCarthy was a 55-year-old father of five who was over visiting um, his mother's home in Ballyfermot. And he answered the door and was gunned down. I think he was shot nine times. Most of those uh, wounds were in his back. So he clearly opened the door and must have turned. Yeah, I mean, there was away. it was one of these murders where, you know, there was actually very few gangland murders that year. It was kind of in the middle of COVID. And normally when somebody is shot dead, they're, uh, they're, the motive at least is, is clear, certainly in a targeted assassination of that type. But Thomas McCarthy was not uh, known for any involvement in organised crime, hadn't, you know, had been in some sort of disputes over the years, very mi- of a very minor type. And there was never in the in the aftermath any particular um, motive given, which is very unusual, especially given the passage of time. But the people who were involved in it or who were suspected of, of involvement in it were certainly known to the Gardaí. Um, very heavily. Um, As you said, Charles McLean would have been known to investigators, was certainly associated with some major league criminals, but wouldn't have been known, wouldn't have been in the papers ever before coming to court. Um, But he wouldn't have been a name that would be on the radar. McCarthy, of course, was just on holidays, so he was living in England. He was living in England from Ballyford. He to go home that day. Yeah, and he obviously had family here, had relations here, but, you know, certainly nothing nothing to indicate that he was uh, some some somebody who would be targeted in this way. But McLean, the suspicion fell on McLean and people around him, and McLean was associating with some very uh, heavy criminals over the over the years, in particular, uh, Mark the guinea pig Desmond and Wayne Whelan, uh, both of whom have subsequently been killed. Or, um, But Mark uh, the guinea pig Desmond would have been our, one of the most notorious criminals in Ireland, a very uh, violent person with a very violent history, um, probably in the latter part of his criminal career had become quite a significant player in, in as a drugs trafficker. Um, they were operating as their own gang with his friend Wayne Whelan um, and with McLean. Um, they were significant players. They were associating uh, with the criminals. I saw uh, Seamus Boland did an interview over the weekend with the Sunday Independent and he said there's very few criminal gangs in Ireland who wouldn't have an association of some type with the Kinnahan cartel. Mm. And that would have been the same for this crew. However, they weren't, I suppose, uh, cartel criminals as such. They were basically operating their own independent drug network in mostly in West Dublin. Um, but they would have dealt with Kinnahan figures and other figures as well, maybe associating with the family. Um, obviously, uh, Mark Desmond would have had a, a long-term association with people like Dee Dee O'Driscoll. But basically what happened, uh, like all of these things, there was these people were all friendly with each other. Um, but ultimately there was a falling out. Uh, what the exact falling out is over is almost definitely to do with drugs and money. 
but um, these people uh, ultimately ended up being killed by their own associates uh, without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, he was he was a hitman himself, Desmond. He was behind a string of murders, including, do you remember that double assassination? Just at the turn of the millennium, there was two young men, a guy called Patrick Murray, who was only 19, and his friend Darren Carey, who was 20. And they were found in the Grand Canal by some walkers a few days into the year 2000. And they had been assassinated and literally, you know, their bodies wrapped and thrown into the waters. And Desmond was only 24 at that stage. There had been some row over money and he'd shot them. And he was sort of notorious in the Ballyfermot area. The other hitman, Eric Lucky Wilson, of course, came out of there as well, mentored by the late Sean Hunt. But Wilson's first kill was of his best friend, who um, was actually a cousin of Mark Desmond's. And Mark Desmond put a hit out on Lucky yeah. Wilson. Yeah. Lucky Wilson went to ground, wasn't really too worried about Desmond, but decided to put caution to the wind and he, he left the area. But Desmond went on to, I mean, you know, he ruled with young guys who were dealing for him and collecting debts where he used to rape them and he was a particularly nasty character. Yeah, he had he had a, a real aura of fear. I mean, he was, at that point, at the turn of the century, he was very much involved in street dealing uh, in parts of the South inner city and parts in Ballyfermot, a lot of heroin dealing, um, really a controlled a network of street dealers. This was making very serious money. Um, as you said, it was maybe like the Westies in Blanchardstown and some other drugs gangs. There was this very, very heavy emphasis on extreme violence to collect relatively small drug debts, a huge amount of intimidation. The, the sexual attack element of it was almost unheard of at that stage. Mm. Um, obviously, he went to court ultimately and put on a bit of a show in court as well if you remember those scenes are quite a while ago now um, but in the aftermath of of maybe the the publicity and around that that was huge as well at the mm. time it was one of those kind of moments in gangland maybe like the murder of Keen Mulready Woods something along those lines that really really shocked people and made people wake up uh, to kind of what was going on in 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 some of these communities um, but Mark Desmond in the last decade really of his life had become quite a significant drugs trafficker um, he built up a close association with Barry Young and Sligo. He lived in Sligo for a time, providing kind of backup. It was kind of working for as an enforcer for him almost, or certainly certainly providing him backup. But he was also dealing. Yeah, he was he was he was a link man through all of these things. Um, he was also acting as a link man for elements of the the, the Rattigan gang as well at times. Uh, while Brian Rattigan was in prison, uh, awaiting a trial for the the murder of Declan Gavin. Uh, Desmond was associating with them. Funnily enough, people who who knew him, who I spoke to, described him as quite soft spoken and could be quite nice, bizarrely. But he had that other it's creepy now. It is a bit creepy and a bit hard to yeah, it's a bit hard to to marry uh, with 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 what was going on. But he was an extraordinarily dangerous person. And um, Wayne Whelan, who ultimately was 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 shot dead in this internal dispute as well. When was Wayne Whelan shot dead? Um, Wayne Whelan was shot dead in November 2019. Because Desmond um, was shot in 2016. Yeah. yeah. So in Desmond was the first to go amongst that, that crew. I mean, Wayne Whelan and, and Mark Desmond had shared a house at one stage. They yeah. were that close. Um, but that was December 2016. It was a significant time, I suppose, because you had in the February of that year, the Kinahan Hutch feud kicking off. And a lot of the focus was on that. People were talking about feuds all the time, but it was the yeah. one feud, the only feud in town. But actually this other feud was going on at the same time in Clondalkin yeah. and uh, in the Clondalkin Valley Fermat areas. And Desmond was, you know, he was 41 when he was killed, actually. Yeah. But our guy, McLean, who we're talking about, who has just pleaded guilty with this, um, this charge relating to that, he was originally charged with murdering Desmond and those charges were dropped. He was, yeah, it was a very complex investigation um, because his people were, you know, he was... 
uh, lured to his death, basically, um, and it was set up within that organization. Um, you know, he was speaking to people who were suspected of murdering him on the on that day. So it 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 wasn't like a hitman was, or it wasn't like a, a team was brought in to kill him. Uh, it was all an internal job. McLean was, yeah, as you said, he was he was charged, but that was downgraded to a lesser charge. Um, so I mean, Wayne Whelan was suspected of basically organizing the murder of his, really one of his closest friends, Mark Desmond. But uh, in the aftermath, um, that dispute continued. Now, Wayne Whelan's murder, there's again, you know, was it, 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 initially it was feared it was, it was a revenge for Mark Desmond, but it seems to be as part of this broader dispute over money. Um, Just months before he was killed, Wayne Whelan survived an assassination attempt. Um, uh, and had then after he he'd been actually taking a picture of himself in hospital I think if I don't know if you remember that um, and then he had left and moved to Alicante while he recovered from his injuries and in November 2019 he had returned to Ireland uh, in just shortly before he was killed um, had attended the funeral of Richie Carberry. Richie Carberry was uh, a brother-in-law of Robbie Lawler and had been murdered as part of the Drogheda feud. And all of these guys, Carberry, Whelan, Desmond, they had become uh, significant regional players, I suppose, in Dublin in the drugs trade. And they were associating with various people, some of them involved in the Kinahan cartel, some of them other drugs gangs. And they become, they like, you know, we always sort of describe them as this gang or that gang. But really what these guys were doing was they were dealing with people on a case by case basis if they could get. And just to keep them. McLean in the picture here, yeah. because, you know, he's emerging as somebody so we know that he was involved or he's suspected of being involved in the actual murder of of Desmond. He's initially charged with that murder and then a lesser charge is brought in. But he was also and has pleaded guilty to the attempted murder of Wayne Whelan. So before he goes to Alicante. So in the Desmond hit, he's working for Wayne Whelan, who's suspected of directing yeah. that hit. And now we have Wayne Whelan coming under target and he's working to murder him. Yes. And facilitate his murder. Now, that first one, he did survive it and he went off to Alicante, came back and was subsequently killed. But so he's, you know, he's playing both sides. He's this shadowy figure that obviously is being trusted by people to arrange or to facilitate these murders. And and in the middle of all that, there's the murder of uh, David Chen Lynch in, yes. in, in March 2019. Now, David Chen Lynch, I don't think, had a significant conviction to his name, if, if even an insignificant conviction to his name. Um, but again, he was suspected of being a money man for this for this uh, drugs gang. He had at, at some point been investigated by CAB, um, had been hit with a bill, um, but he was also an associate of Desmond, Whelan and McLean and he was shot dead. There's never been anybody uh, charged in connection with his murder. But that is also believed to be part of this broader dispute, which all again centres on on money and drugs and um, disputes over over those drugs. And, you know, certainly in, in, in the case of Wayne Whelan, uh, what he was recruited to, to get rid of Desmond or decided to get rid of Desmond, it is believed that his murder ultimately was sanctioned by people within the Kinahan cartel mm -hmm. rather than ordering it or carrying it out. Similar to other murders we've seen in Dublin that they were told it could be done, you, you can go ahead with it and do it, which is also something that happened at a significant number of murders over the last 20 years in Ireland. For sure. Now, uh, McLean, as we started with this murder of Thomas McCarty in Ballyfermot, he is also pleading guilty. So he's also there. Now that murder really was complex because we don't know exactly, certainly the victim had no known associations with organised crime, was on his holidays, as we say. His mother gave a victim impact statement in relation to that and she witnessed the whole thing and describes like that she's been living in a complete hell ever since she saw it, since the day he was killed in the place he loved and the place he should have been safe. Um, 
she said that he'd spent the previous few weeks visiting his family and was due to go back home that evening. And she says in her victim impact statement that that day would rip our hearts out and change their families forever. He's the last thing I think of before I go to sleep and the first thing I think of when I wake up, she said. Thomas was the apple of my eye and I have an emptiness inside me which could never be reversed. That's the kind of stuff that's often forgotten when you start talking about gangland murders. They're so functional. They're so, you know, part of business, really, of gangland. And every gangland murder behind it is a family, a grieving, you know, this this man, McCarthy, was married for 31 years to his own wife and had children himself. And, like, it's easy to forget about that, isn't it? In In the complexities of what's going on to cause the murder, the drug debts, the big mob in Spain that's sanctioning things, you know, who's who and who's kind of hiring which hit team. Um, but just to say that that obviously is, and, and each of those, I'm sure even Mark Desmond, although I don't think very many people stood to mourn him, but there certainly were people in... Look, I mean, even touched. even Mark Desmond, I do remember seeing tributes from his family on, on, on social media. But certainly, you know, you can... To some extent, you can say people involved themselves in a certain lifestyle, and you know it. it, it but I'm certainly in the case of Thomas McCarthy, it's that that cannot be said of him. Mm. Um, he seemed a genuinely harmless guy who never deserved what, what the mm. end that he had. And of course, it's so traumatic for a family to lose somebody in that way, and then of course for that to be in the papers and to have all of that level of 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 you know people looking into in, in looking into your grief I suppose so yeah there's it's there's uh, you know those those types of deaths where somebody is killed on their own doorstep I think always really really strike the family very very hard the mother God love her I mean, exactly and horrendous. people people have to live in that house then and the power and the noise of of gunfire from a nine millimeter like is yeah you know frightening and of course Maybe. there's then the daily reminder as you go in your front door and yeah. all of those things so look it's 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 horrific but and it's the business in the end of the day it's part and parcel of the business of gangland and really there has been more and more career opportunities for people involved in okay in money laundering obviously we'll take from say 2000 when when Desmond um conducts those assassinations on the side of the Grand Canal and throws those two teenagers in to be found by people out walking a couple of days later. But that was a really boom time. Like that was the the Celtic Tiger boom for gangland from 2000 onwards. You had more money in the country. You had um, cocaine coming in on absolute wholesale basis. You had a lot more gangs getting involved and falling out and fighting with one another. And as a result, you had these new job opportunities for people who wanted to get involved in the dirtier side of the business or who maybe had skill sets. And they include hit teams. And of course, there isn't just usually one shooter, although some assassins do work alone. But mostly there are getaway drivers, spotters. You have people who will plant devices on cars. You will have those who sit in the background and direct proceedings. You have those who buy the phones and give out the phones. And like we've had a lot of intel into how these hit teams operate in recent times with the failures, I suppose, of the Kinahan organization to conduct a lot of hits because of the level of intelligence coming in on them to the guards and those guard operations that were put in place to stop hits happening. And as a result, we've had trials before the court and we can hear the kind of evidence and the kind of... um, work that goes into these things. Yeah, I mean, if you look at in in before the feud, people were either caught uh, shooting them or not really. Yeah. And um, the logistics people rarely came before before the courts. But I suppose the advent of 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 like mobiles and things like that have made they probably made planning murders easier, but they've also made catching people I in those other a roles. Concentration now though from the state to make sure that anybody involved in, yeah. a, in a murder or in a hit knows that even if you literally make a phone call. I mean, when you look at Regina Kyo, yeah. the, the sister of... Johnny Kyo. Johnny Kyo, thank yeah. you. Of Johnny Kyo. She was living in the north inner city in Avondale House and her brother, who was an ex-INLA bomb maker, had got involved or offered his services to the Kinahan cartel for money. He believed he could 
help kill some of their targets in the Hutch organization. And Gareth Hutch was identified because he was living in Avondale House. And in April of 2017, um, he was getting out. He was actually come out of his flat and he went to walk to his car. He was going to try and get a transfer out of there because he felt so, uh, you know, under threat really and had a young child who often stayed with him. And as he walked to his car, two gunmen came up behind him and shot him dead. And what emerged from the investigation was those gunmen had spent the night in Regina Kyo's flat, which yep. overlooked that car park, which had a, a, a perfect view, say, of Gareth Hutch's ap- apartment or flat and where they were able to sit and wait. But Regina Kyo, when she became came before the courts, a mother of five with some drug issues and uh, a difficult background, was convicted of murder. Yeah. she There was no other charge for her but that. And I remember the judge didn't really, he was given no other alternative. It was just one charge of murder. She pleaded not guilty and there was a trial. Yeah. Um, you know. But, yeah, I mean, these, I don't think uh, this is this is a relatively new development where, and, and it is um, some of these cases that have come before the courts involving Kinahan plots, a lot of them have been facilitation or conspiracy charges, mm-hmm. which basically, uh, you know, somebody can, you know, for example, you know, put a tracker device on a car. At one point in our previous criminal history, we would have regarded that as how can you prove that's that's connected to a murder? Yeah. I mean, it, uh, common sense would tell you that it is. But the use of the gangland laws allows, you know, people to be done for facilitation. And what the guards effectively have to prove in a court or the DPP is that, that you know, that person did put the planted the tracker with the knowledge of the criminal organization mm, mm. and with the knowledge that that tracker could only be used for one purpose. It wasn't to, you know, to check up on if somebody's having an affair. It was clearly for for the use of a, a criminal gang. So you've seen a lot of people convicted in that way. Regina Kyo is absolutely an interesting case where um, it's, it's sort of an older case of sort of joint design where, you know, by you didn't pull the trigger everybody knows that but there you know you knew what was going to happen yeah. and therefore you helped the the murder could not have happened effectively without, you without your help. flat for them to, to exactly watch the and, property and you didn't you knew he wasn't gonna go down and stick a, a custard pie in his face like you knew something was gonna you knew that there was murderous intent so there, there's there's they picked up a lot of these and there have been other cases involving dissident groups as well where you've had these multiple people uh, arraigned on these kind mm. of these joint design charges but if you look back 20 years ago I don't think I think people were done for murder if they were caught in possession of a gun or with uh, you know firearms residue on their hands or linked to, to getaway cars but the people who were ordering them mm. were much harder to get at I think yeah still are I suppose the still are ones directing it yeah so Charles McLean is one of these sort of um, he's operating in not particularly an area, but he's operating within sort of a grouping of associates who've fallen out. But they all obviously think they can trust him at one point. Well, I mean, exactly. I mean, there's double crossing and then double crossing of the double crossers. Yeah. Um, And it must be a horrible way to live. I mean, all these guys, I don't know if they've known each other all their lives, but they certainly all grew up in, in similar areas. Like a lot of the people who've come before the courts they're all kind of in their late 40s and as you said they obviously boom together in in good times um and uh you know but then when money becomes a factor greed becomes a factor people turn on each other and Mm. it is a horrible way to live that you that you it's interesting you said there that wayne whelan came back from alicante to attend the funeral of richie carberry um you know, obviously killed as part of that Drogheda feud because, of course, he was a, a dealer who moved up to Bettystown area and saw an opportunity for himself. He was a very ambitious guy, actually. Yeah. Very ambitious and was very early on money laundering through his own companies. He was based, he was originally from sort of, is it Donamede or... Donamede, yeah. Yeah. And he was sort of operating, but I think clashing with the Mr. Big Gang who were becoming probably more powerful and showing their ability to uh, take somebody out because yeah. they were becoming, you know, very familiar suspects in a number of of gangland murders. And I think probably in particular when 
uh, the murder occurred of Alan Ryan in 2012, the head of the Real IRA in the South. That really put it up to everybody about who Mr. Big's gang were. They'd yeah. taken on the dissidents and they were ready to, f- to face down a threat if the Northern Command had to come into Dublin like a ton of bricks to avenge his murder, which they didn't. But um, I think that Carberry had moved up to Meath, Louth area. He had seen weaknesses in the Cornelius Price Maguire gang. He had seen um, a little bit of unease in the underlings and was it going to be able to provide them with weaponry and with drugs and sort of lured them uh, a sort of a, a crew who would have been very well trained by the Maguire's prices, but didn't feel that they were too well treated and wanted to go it alone. And he became their mentor and their supplier. Um, but of course, he's shot dead. And then his brother-in-law, Robbie Lawler, is shot dead. And Wayne Whelan, who attends his funeral, is shot dead. It's just... Would you not think at some point they'd have a look at all this, the yeah. consequences and kind of go, if I get involved in this, I'm going to get shot dead. Or are you so far in at that stage that you just have to keep pushing on through? I think like if you, if you look at Wayne Whelan, like he was, he survived an assassination attempt, was very lucky, the first one. Um, and then he'd gone over to Alicante. And did he have an option of retiring and leaving the life behind? Maybe he didn't. So I do think people get in too deep. Um, I think there's always a, a thing in gangland of people believing they're smarter than the others. Uh, it's not going to happen to them and that they can sort of get through this and come out on top. Um, but yeah, like if you look, those all of those guys that we've mentioned there, Robbie Lawler, Alan Ryan, um, you know, they're all of a similar age. Mm. Many of them grew up together. Alan Ryan would have you know, grown up at the same time as Mr. Big, Richie Carberry would have grown up being very friendly with people in the Mr. Big gang as as a young man. And yeah, it's it's the late 40s is not a good time to be a, a, a gangland criminal. Or the early, for the 40s in general. If you, <laughs> well, it may be in 40s in general in life, but if you, it, there's not a lot of them come out of their 40s still alive, still out of prison. I was going to say the rest of us start worrying about <laughs> our diet and our yeah, 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 and maybe yeah. little bits of blood pressure and yeah. things like that. But these guys have have bigger issues, don't they? They do. Um, as so McLean is now serving two consecutive sentences of 16 and a half years imprisonment. So that was for his uh, involvement in the original plot to kill Wayne Whelan. Yeah. Uh, which he survived that shooting and the murder of Thomas McCarthy, which um, he pleaded guilty to the facilitation of. And now he has been given a another eight years, but that will be served at the same time, I think, for impeding the apprehension of the person who murdered Desmond. Yeah. So 16 and a half years, he's 35 now. Um, He's going to be out probably at 45. Yeah. I always ask you this, what will he do? Will he go back to what he knows? Well, I we mean... We don't know much about his personality, Charles McLean. No, we don't know He's much. A sort of shadowy character, isn't he? A shadowy character, um, certainly, as I said, known to the Gardaí, but not one of these guys who, certainly Mark Desmond was very publicly, you know, lived off his reputation, uh, was happy to be uh, sort of publicly viewed with people. Um, McLean doesn't seem to be like that, but when he comes out, even just being associated with all these these uh, murders must put him at risk from from people who knew these guys who were who were shot dead. Um, or you know, will that be? I mean, we're talking in ten years' time. Like, what will it look like then? And will a guy like him be? I mean, all these names we talk about now: Richie Carberry, Robbie Lawler. They'll all be forgotten. There'll be people of the past. There will be a new well, if breed, you, uh, even on top of what there is there now. Well, let's look at Robbie Lawler, right? One of the thorns in Robbie Lawler's side was a young man um, who was uh, had a deep resentment, let's put it that way, against Robbie Lawler following the murder of a guy called Fred Lynch. Um, I think the murder of Fred Lynch was back in the early 2000s. Robbie Lawler was the chief suspect, believed to have pulled the trigger and uh, never prosecuted for it. 
So these things don't necessarily get forgotten. Mm. And, you know, Robbie Lawler, as far as I'm aware, I know in, in, in terms of that murder, I don't think it was a particularly personal shooting. Um, he, he carried it out as a, a, you know, a fearless young gun, if you want to say Robbie Lawler. But it certainly came back to haunt him. Mm. I think he lured him out as well. And uh, he had been, he knew him. Yeah. I mean, that was something that was always, or is always a little bit... Uh, sort of significant when you look back at Lawler, he would shoot friend or foe. Yeah. It didn't matter. Yeah. Sometimes it was because of a personal grudge and sometimes it was because he was on a payday. Yeah. And I like to think there's not that many no. people out there like that. I mean, we've just spoken about a lot of murders there, gangland murders, you know, people in the background of all those murders would have been paid. But those who can actually go out and take a life and be the trigger man, and kill somebody because they've taken, you know, I mean, I say many things to you yeah, yeah. over the course no. of our chats here. Yeah. And, you know, if you I'd were barely like, I, if you were a Robbie Lawler, yeah. I'd be dead and gone. Yeah, I just, yeah, I, I wouldn't do anything worse than kneecap you, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, like if, if this, this is, this is the way there isn't that many people that are willing to kill for money. I mean, there are a few but they are still a, a, a rarity. Um, but you did see with the with the, the Kinnahan cartel, they were absolutely willing to order murders over mm. relatively small amounts of money, let alone the few that obviously got deeply personal and all of that. And, you know, we always talk about the number of killings in the Hutch Kinnahan feud. But if you go back 20 years, the amount of the role they played in so many of these murders um, in, in, in parts of West Dublin and parts of beyond where they mightn't have had a direct role, but they were giving nods, helping arrange stuff all the time. Mm. And I mean, it's a, it's a really uh, list of, of debt really, isn't it going back? I mean, we had a, a an editor used to say, "Oh, not the Kinnan cartel involved again." Being, being tongue in cheek, obviously saying, yeah. "You know, they're 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 linked to everything, and it just becomes repetitive." But that is the way it was, wasn't it? Yeah, you wonder with the actual trigger men. You know, I know in many cases, and I have seen some of them in the dock, in the special criminal court. They're young guys who maybe have been somewhat groomed. They have maybe had to do this or feel they have to do this. They've been sent out to kill. We take Barry Doyle as an example of that, the younger brother of Paddy Doyle, within months of his brother's murder by the Kinnahan cartel out on the Costa del Sol. He was down in the arms of the Dundon McCarthy mob and he had kind of gone to them almost for solace. After his brother was murdered, he was fed drugs and he was sent out then to pay for those yeah, drugs. Yeah, to pay back, yeah. To kill uh, yeah. John Pitchfork McNamara. Yeah. He went out to kill him and in a case of mistaken identity, killed the rugby player. Shane Gagan, Shane Gagan yeah. which was, you know, another line in the sand, maybe that the Dundon McCarthy mob crossed, but horrific. But Barry Doyle, I would have thought, was not a natural born killer. No. But I think his brother Paddy was. His brother Paddy was definitely the most feared person in in, in Ireland's underworld at, during, at his day. Um, like he was a personal hitman for Freddie Thompson during the, the Crumlin Drimna feud. He left Ireland in about 20, 2006 or seven, because he had murdered three people in two days. Yeah. Two of whom were his friends who had got into a car or he'd got into the car to talk with them about a bit of business or something. And he had lifted a gun and shot each of them in the back of the head in a scene that you'd only see something like it on Pulp Fiction. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, can you imagine the, just the proximity to that kind of an injury to a human being. Yeah, I mean, he was a big, tall, strong guy. Paddy Doyle, uh, you know, could be very intimidating, uh, you know. Um, but Barry Doyle was not, didn't have that reputation growing up. No. Didn't have that. Uh, people used to say he was a harmless Egypt, really. And he was a footballer and everything, wasn't he? He was he, also a big, strong Yeah, big. Uh, but So we ended up in Limerick and we, we talk about people being paid five-figure sums for murders and all of that. But Barry Doyle got told, off you go. Yeah. There was no money being handed over. No. There was nothing. Uh, they'd, you given had no... him, they'd given him a place to stay as in his, I suppose, raw grief or whatever it was for his brother. 
and they'd fed him with drugs yeah, and he had to pay them back. Yeah, he'd feared for his safety. Jared Dundon had been a particularly good friend of Paddy Doyle's. Uh, Barry Doyle had feared for his safety, didn't know who had killed his brother and had been in touch with, with the Dundons and they brought him down. Um, but again, there was others as well involved in, in some of them murders. Um, there was no money being chained. Mm changing hands down in Limerick. There was no 50, 60 grand to carry out hits. People were being told to do it and yeah. that was that. Mm. Um, so there is a lot of, uh, a lot of the hitmen, you know, aren't really hitmen. It's, no, you that's know. the thing. I mean, there certainly are a number of different kinds of them, but I do think amongst all that are some of those natural born killers. There are. And I mean, Eric, Eric Lucky Wilson will be the classic example yeah. um, of somebody who, who seemed to relish his, his job. Absolutely would kill anybody for money once it was handed over um, and there are there are some of them mm. but it, it, it's a funny mix really isn't it mm, for sure anyway grim uh, conversation there but uh, uh, and in the middle of it all obviously our victims and their families and um, also you know Charles McLean if we've uh, heard the end of him or not well we won't you know he'll be out in a period of time um, but to have that on your reputation, I mean, there's very few people that have been, although he's not been convicted of murder, um, to have a role in three in three gangland murders is, you know, it's really, really, uh, I can't think of another person really who's been, had that conviction to his name. Okay, thanks, Niall. Thanks, Nicola. I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.